have your Bibles, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I'm going to be reading from the King James Version. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I'm going to preach a message to you called Addicted. Everybody shout out Addicted. 1 Corinthians 16. When you found your place, say amen. amen. 1 Corinthians 16, starting in verse 15. I'm going to read two verses here. I don't know if they have both, but I'm going to read 15 and 16. Paul says here, I beseech you, and you ought to study that because that's, that's strong emotional verbiage. I beseech you, brethren, and he says, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have, what's that word? They have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Verse 16, that ye may submit yourself unto such, and to everyone that helpeth with us, and I like this word here as well, and laboreth. And labor with us. Everybody shout out labor. So this will be my Labor Day message. How about that? Because I'm, I'm not preaching on Labor Day. So this is my Labor Day message. That just came to me. That's really good. So let's pray real quick. Y'all want to? Let's pray with the word. Father, bless this word. And bless me, your messenger. And bless every ear that this falls upon. That we would hear with our natural ears, and we would hear with our spiritual ears, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I chose the King James Version because it uses the word addicted. Everybody shout out that word again, addicted. It says that they addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, which is the only time the word addiction is used in all of the Bible is right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And it's associated with serving and ministering to God's people. They addicted themselves. No one forced them. No one pushed them. There was no trickery involved in this. There was no manipulation involved in this. They addicted themselves to the work of the ministry of the saints. The Bible says they willingly addicted themselves or devoted themselves to the ministry. In El Dorado in Union County, we are very familiar with the addiction pandemic. Uh, it has hit probably every city and every state in America. But right here where we are, we feel the effects of what addiction does to the lives of people. Right here where our church is, we are on the verge of uh, the outskirts, if you will, or the beginning of where most of the drug trafficking is in our city and our county. Uh, we have what they call crack houses around us. Um, uh, there are houses here where they're actually dealing drugs. Uh, you can see it, it's very evident. Uh, you can watch, you can walk around, drive around, you can see it. And right here where our church is located, I believe is a very strategic place, that God strategically placed this church right here for this reason and for this time. And so none of us are strangers to the addiction pandemic and we know about drugs and alcohol and God only knows the addictions that are out there. It's nothing uncommon. Uh, I walk the property pretty frequently. It's nothing uncommon to find needles, drug paraphernalia. Uh, on this property, we, we find it pretty regular, pretty often. In fact, we have found needles on the roof uh, I don't know if they're just throwing, I don't, they have no way to get up there. Uh, I don't know if they're just throwing it in the air or what, but you will find stuff in the most oddest places on this property. Um, addiction is prevalent. It's prevalent, and it's taken the lives of men, women, boys, and girls. And uh, we know about alcohol as well. It's another addiction that is just, um, they call alcohol the gateway drug, and Good grief, do I know that. I, I know it firsthand. I've never experienced that addiction myself. But doing what I do as a pastor, I deal with this 
often, often, I mean very often. In fact, Alicia and I um, are helping another family right now that, that's not a part of this church. And the alcohol addiction is destroying this family. And I mean, it is just unbelievable what this, uh, let's call it a pandemic, what it will do, alcohol will do. Uh, I've never seen anything good come from alcohol. Never, never. I, I've never seen anything good come from it. I don't care if it's social drinking. I've never seen anything good come from alcohol. I just haven't. Now, you may disagree with me, and you have every right to disagree with me, but you ought to walk a few feet in these shoes that I have on, and you would hate it like I hate it because it destroys homes, it destroys families and marriages, kids, and it is awful. Alcohol is awful. It, it just tears people apart. It, it takes you out of who you really are. And anytime you're under the influence of something else, that's why it's called spirits. Wine, liquor, and spirits. Because you are influenced by another spirit. Amen? And it's not the Holy Spirit. So I, I, I hate alcohol with an addiction. Another, another addiction that is taking over our country and has for quite some time, but it is becoming more prevalent because it is more accepted. And now it has even become legal, and I think it will become totally legal at some point. And that's marijuana. Marijuana is dumbing our young people down. It is destroying their lives. And what marijuana does is it, um, it numbs you, it makes you have no feelings, and it also, it, it, it detaches you from really life. And so there's no responsibility, there's no work ethic, um, you're just numb to everything. And that is what the devil is wanting to do to the lives of people. Listen to me. He is destroying people, destroying people with these addictions. Can I hear an amen? amen? So you cannot be in this area and not personally have struggled with or know someone who has struggled with an addiction. Can I hear an amen on that? Every family in this room has been impacted by an addiction. I, I, I don't even have to guess on that. I know that. Every family in this room has dealt with uh, someone and struggled with someone who is having an addiction. The point is we all know addiction at some level, and some of us know addiction. It's not alcohol, it's not drugs, it's not pot, it's none of those things. Some of us are addicted to our cell phones. Amen. Some of you would rather lose your children than lose your phone. Watch your reaction. You will freak out more when you leave your, your phone than you will your children. <laughs> it's okay to laugh. It's okay. It's very true. Laugh at yourself. Some people are addicted to work. Some, of them, some people are. Here, to me, is an alarming addiction that is super alarming to me and that I am paying very close attention to and as a pastor I combat it very often. Uh, it is taking over this this country for sure and I, it's taken over Christians. It really is and here it is. It's the approval of people. And social media is feeding this frenzy. That we want people's approval so bad. We want their likes, we want their comments, we want their hearts. We want their emojis. Uh, we want people to notice us. Can I tell you, you've already been pre-approved by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Why do, are you seeking other people's approval? There's only one person's approval you need, and his name is Jesus, and you got it. Okay, so you don't have to feel insecure, and I know that's a lot to unpack in a few sentences, but um, the approval of people is an addiction. I believe God puts something on the inside of us that makes us devote ourselves to something bigger than us, greater than us. 
And if that is not channeled right or harnessed right, then that will go somewhere. It's, it's going to come out somewhere. That God created us with this internal, if you will, motor that, that God made us to where we will devote ourselves to something. Paul here was intently and emotionally, that's why I use the word beseech, telling the church at Corinth about these other churches, and he's telling them they are addicted to serving. This is what it looks like to serve God with your whole heart. The word addiction probably doesn't mean what we think it means. In the Greek, the word addiction means deliberate. So here's what that means. They deliberately arranged their lives in such a way that they could give service to God. Everything was filtered through their deliberate serving, not the other way around. I won't buy this. I won't go here. I won't give my time to this or that. If it's going to rob my life from the opportunity and the privilege to serve and to minister in God's house. What I see today, and I'm not dogging anyone, I'm not on your case because we have a wonderful church here and we're creating a culture of serving, so certainly I have nothing to, to knock you guys about, but, but as I, what I see as a whole is our lives are not arranged for God. God is just a step if we get to Him. He's, he's just down the line somewhere. And if we get to God, then great. If we don't, then okay. We have too many other priorities in the way. And God is not a priority. And serving God is not a priority. But what Paul is saying here about this church is he's saying they were addicted to serving. They were deliberately arranging their lives so they could serve and be, be a blessing and minister to the saints. We know that addicts, addiction, is those who somehow along the way got hooked. So now they need a fix because now they're addicted. Now they have a thirst. Now they're obsessed. They have a hunger. They're not playing games. This is real to them. It is meaningful to them. And in some cases, it's life or death. I want to tell you guys today that what we're doing right here at One Community and you don't really see it right now, but I promise you as this thing progresses, you're going to see it. And I think it's already starting to happen. But us being here is life or death for some people. And I mean physical death and I mean spiritually as well. That our church is strategically lay, uh, here. God has put us here. There is a mantle that has been passed to this congregation for this city and for this county. And I believe that is life and death, eternal life for somebody that it's, it, it's our church being here and us being a part of serving in ministry. This is meaningful. If you follow Jesus' life, he was addicted. The Bible says he was consumed with zeal for God's house. When you look at Jesus' ministry, the symbol for his ministry is not a rock, it's not a throne, it's not a crown, but it's a towel. And he invites us to follow him in his footsteps and to serve. Jesus came to serve. In fact, that's what he said. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. When you come in the parking lot this morning, there were already those who were in service to God here at One Community. There were people in strategic places and they were serving. The entryways, the lobbies, even in the kids' area, there were people there that were ready to serve. And they're not mad, and they're not doing it begrudgingly. And if they are, come talk to me, because I want to meet them and talk to them. That's a joke, okay? Subway. Yeah, somewhat of a joke. <laughs> and what he just said is a personal joke. They have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. And so what I want to do today is I want to give you, and I learned this through study, that there are some laws to addiction. So I'm going to give you five laws of addiction. I have five points today, but nobody take a deep breath and look sad because it's not going to take that long. <laughs> I'm typically a three-pointer guy, 
But today's five points, they'll go real fast. Number one, here's the first law of addiction. You have to get started. At some point, someone had to take the hit. At some point, someone had to take the drag. At some point, someone had to take the first snort. At some point, someone had to take the first drink. Paul said, I urge you to know that their addiction started with serving that they had to take the step. And at some point, you have to take the first step and say, I'm not just going to spectate. I'm not just going to watch. Everybody is called to serve God. If Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life, there isn't a choice. Do I serve or do I not serve? No. If Jesus is the Lord of your life, you will serve Him. But what happens to a lot of people is they just never get started. They just never get started. And I love this about our church because I think our church is one of the few, and that's certainly not saying we're one of the best. But I believe our church has has something very unique because we have systems in place for you to serve. And it's introduced to you the first time you walk in here. And if you come to our membership class, we talk in a segment of that that talk. We, We talk to you about serving. And I think that's what sets us apart and makes this church unique than a lot of other churches. They serve and there's a lot of things, but they can't can't verbally tell you how to do that. What we can do here is we can just tell you, but we can actually place you into service. And I believe that makes our church unique. A lot of people just don't get started. And people, you know, see people serving and they see people back in the kids wing and our community kids changing diapers and they're like, that's crazy. Why would anybody do that? That's because you've never got started. Because once you discover there is a high to what we do, when you see lives change, when you hear the stories, when you see the faces light up, when you hug someone who has been broken over a decision they made 40 years ago, but yet God is healing their heart. There is a high that comes with that that nothing else will compare to. Nothing compares to that. When someone walked up to me the other day and and they're in their 60s and they went through freedom this last semester. And in freedom, one of the things that God really spoke to them and highlighted to them was their relationship with their father that was not good. And in that relationship with their father, this man is in his 60s and his dad has never told him one time that he loved him. Not once. He lives in another city. And he said during the Freedom Weekend that as we were praying for him and as God, the Holy Spirit was showing him things, that, that as God spoke to his heart, he began to pray for his dad. And he said, I'd already I'd, I prayed for my dad a long time, but I had prayed the wrong prayer. <laughs> but in freedom, God changed my prayer for my dad, and I started praying in another way. And as I started praying for my dad, about a week to two weeks later, and I forget the timeline, his dad called and said, hey, His dad is in his 90s, and he said, I can't come to you, but would you come to me? And he went to see his dad, and when he walked in the door, his dad said, I love you. (laughs) Guys, when you experience that, there is nothing that compares to that. Now God is restoring their relationship. Now they're actually going out to eat and taking time with each other. And they've never done this. This guy is in his 60s. And now experiencing a relationship with his dad. There is a high to what we do. It's the only reason I do this. It's not because I like it. It's because there's a high to this. And when you experience the high of somebody's life being changed, and you were a part of that, Oh my goodness, there is not a hit in the world that will describe that or, or, or emulate that. When you experience a life being changed, there's a high to it. There's a high. And whether or not you directly had anything to do with it or indirectly had anything to do with it, you were just addicted to playing your part and serving. 
Serving. Serving the body of Christ and serving people. Here's the second law of addiction. If you're going to get hooked, verse 14 says, All that was done was done in love. So here's number two. You must love it. You have to love him. You have to love his church. And you have to love his people. And guess what? They're not always easy to love. Not you guys. Y'all are angels, I promise. But there are difficult people in church. And there are hard to love people. And they're everywhere. They're everywhere. And our job is to create an environment that is conducive for God to work in somebody else's life. And here's our job, to remove every obstacle. Anything that would keep somebody from experiencing the Lord, that's our job. And once we have removed the obstacles and once we've created an environment for people to come and to hear about Jesus and and experience His presence, then you know what we do? We get out of the way. Once we remove those obstacles, get them in His presence, then we step back out of the way because it has nothing to do with us and everything to do with Him. So we get out of the way. Everybody say, get out of the way. You can't love people if you don't put effort into it. It has to be uh, thought out, it has to be thoughtful, and it has to be intentional. There has to be intentionality. And to me, this is the story of the prodigal son running out to meet the prodigal lost son. You have to love it. It's something you crave. It's something you need more of. And the Bible says, love not the world or the things of the world. That's what Paul saw in, in, in Achaia. And when he saw that love and addiction, it moved him and it refreshed his spirit. And this is what God's people are supposed to look like, addicted to ministry, the ministry of the saints. That's what we're called to do. I heard this story many years ago and it impacted me. I pray it impacts you. But a preacher walked into a diner one night at 3 a.m. and he couldn't sleep. So there was a diner a few blocks from his home, and so he walked up to the diner to get some coffee and some breakfast. And as he was sitting there on the stool of this cafe, this little diner, he noticed that some prostitutes walked in behind him and sat down a few uh, benches over from where he was sitting. And he wasn't trying to eavesdrop, but he could hear their conversation And one of them, of course, they were talking about their night and so forth. And one of them said, tomorrow is your birthday. And the girl said, yes, tomorrow is my birthday. And as they began to talk, the preacher could overhear their conversation. And they said, we ought to throw you a birthday party. And the girl, her response was, I forgot how old she was, but she said, I'm such and such years old, and no one has ever thrown me a birthday party. So as the pastor got up to leave, he walked over to the man that was in charge, the manager of the cafe, and he said, do those girls come in here frequently? And he said, my guess is they come in here every night. And he said, yes, every night about 3 a.m. when they're done with work, They come into this cafe, and they talk about their night, and so forth and so on, how much money they made, and blah, blah, blah. And he said, I couldn't help, the pastor said, I couldn't help but overhear that one of the girls is having a birthday party tomorrow, or a birthday tomorrow. And he said, I would like to throw her a party, a birthday party tomorrow morning at 3 a.m. I'd like to come back and he said I'll pay for everything I'll pay for the food and I'll go out and get decorations and I'd like to decorate this cafe at 3 a.m. for this young girl and I'd like to throw her a birthday party and the guy said absolutely not a problem he said they come in every every morning at 3 a.m. he said they'll be here and I'll gladly help you with that as I heard that story I thought what kind of preacher throws a prostitute a birthday party and my thought was not a normal one not a normal one but one who values souls 
Guys, I want to tell you, it's a privilege to do this. It's not an obligation. It's not a job. But we want to be the kind of church that would throw a prostitute a birthday party. And we don't want to be normal. Well, I went to church and I sit there on the pew for 15 years. Not this church. Not this church. We're going to get you off your mm mm-hmm. Because we're not going to sit here for 15 years and just sit here. We're not going to come in here and say, this is my seat. I'll give this seat up for somebody who don't know Jesus any day, any time, anywhere. I'll stand up if I have to. I don't care. But I'll throw a prostitute a birthday party. Come on, church. Come on. So I want to invite you. Not me, the Holy Spirit wants to invite you to take the first hit. When are you going to take your first hit? Do you know what it's like? Do you know what it's like? Have you ever led somebody to Jesus? Do you know the percentage of church people who have never led somebody in the sinner's prayer? If you ever do it once, you're addicted. You're addicted. What would it be like to grab somebody by the hand and say, can I lead you to Jesus? Oh, I'm going to tell you, it's the most awesome feeling you'll ever feel in your life. And once you feel it, you will go, ah, da-da, like the angels sing. And it's like an experience that you've never experienced. And you go, this is why I was created. When you experience that. Here's number three. This is going to be a fun one. Addicted people are not picky people. Picky people are addicted to themselves and their way. Not so with addicted people. Some of God's people are picky. Not y'all. Not y'all. Mm-mm. Good say, yeah. Some of God's people are grumpy. Grumpy pants. Yeah, not y'all, not y'all. Listen to me. Addicted people don't care where the fix comes from. They just need a fix. They could care less. When you make a decision to be addicted to the ministry of the saints, it's, it's a decision to not be picky. Doesn't matter if it's my way. All I care about is people are being reached. Amen? Doesn't matter if it's my style. Doesn't matter how he preaches. As long as he's preaching the word. Doesn't matter what's going on. I just want to reach people. Don't have to be my way or the highway. Y'all want me to get off this? Because y'all look uncomfortable. Come on. Addicted people are not picky people. Nitpicking, I, I, that drives me crazy. Nitpicking everything somebody does. Now, not y'all, but there are people that will Facebook stop. Not y'all. There are people who will Facebook stalk other churches. What are they doing? Why do they do that for? That's stupid. Not y'all, not y'all. I will not live my life being a critic. I'm just not going to do it. Made up my mind a long time ago. I'm not going to be critical. If somebody else is doing something for God, I will not be critical of them. I will not judge them. I will not tell them what they can do better, especially if they never ask. Okay? Okay? Picky people. Picky people. And most of the time, picky people have grumpy people attached to them. Right? I will not be a critic. We have become so picky that we have lost sight of souls. Nitpicking everything. We're not going to reach people being picky. How far will an addict go? They will rob their own grandmother. That's pretty far. They will also prostitute their own bodies. I would say that's pretty far. 
They need their fix. The question Paul is asking to the church is how far will you go? How far will you go to reach somebody? What extremes will you go to to see someone else experience the same love and grace that you've experienced? Addic addicts are not picky. And I am so thankful Jesus was not picky. And he's not coming back for a picky church. He's coming back for a devoted church, an addicted church, a committed church, a soul winning church. Come on, church. Give God a hand clap. Not a little hand clap, a big hand clap. That's the kind of church Jesus is coming for. Y'all ready for number four? Here it is, write it down. It spreads. It spreads. Everybody say spreads. Have y'all ever noticed that the drug cartel will go over, through, and under borders to get their product out? Y'all ever notice that? Um, I heard something the other day that was alarming about the people coming into this country on a, on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly, I don't know, don't quote me on this, but it was some kind of crazy number of the size of the city of Atlanta, Georgia. The population is how many people are coming into this country. And if that is happening, then how much drug, how many drugs are coming into this country? Think about that. that it's, it's a sobering thought. They will, the, 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 the drug people will even swallow balloons filled with product, even if it's death. They are so committed, they'll personally sacrifice their own life to get what they are addicted to out to other people. Let me tell you something. God calls his church to think this way. What borders do we have to get across where are there people that are hurting? Where do we need to go to take the gospel of Jesus Christ? Listen, there is a risk to everything you do. There's just a risk. And if, if you're afraid of the risk, you need to stay in the house and you need to shut the blinds and never come out. Because there is a risk to anything you do. And what we're going to do this week as many of you know, we're, we're going to be serving the Central Arkansas Development Council uh, this week and partnering with them this week in our west parking lot over here to distribute food. And I'm going to tell you, it's a risk involved. There's a lot of risk involved. The risks have kept me up at night. I know all the risk. I know all the things that we're doing, and I know the risks we're taking when we do this. But can I tell you today, it's worth the risk. I've counted the cost, and I'm sure there's more costs that I haven't even accounted for yet. But you know what? I decided it's worth getting in the game. Because what will it take to reach people? What's it going to take to touch somebody's life? Whatever that is, I'm in for it. And I want to tell you, there's a risk for anything. Do you know there's a risk to joining a church? There's a risk to that. Because there's a huge risk that somebody will hurt your feelings. Wherever there are people, there are problems. That's just the truth. I, I love what a pastor's wife said one time. The more I pastor people, the more I love animals. Because <laughs> they don't talk back. Wherever there's people, there's problems. Just, it's just part of it. There, you, there's, there's never such a thing as not a risk. So if you join a church, there's a good risk. Somebody will hurt you. Somebody will hurt your feelings. But I want to invite you tonight or today to get in the game of risk. You know what? I'm, I'm not going to play it safe. I'm not going to live for comfort. I want to be involved in life's being changed, and I'm not going to stop every time it gets uncomfortable or it's awkward or my feelings get hurt, or it costs me something. No, no, I'm going to stay addicted and devoted. Amen. That's some, some pretty good preaching. I haven't heard a lot of amens, but it's some good preaching. <laughs> I'm messing with you. Number five, here's the last one. Addicted people are tenacious. Have y'all ever noticed, is it just me, because I deal with this a lot, have you ever noticed that, that addicted people have all kinds of options to quit? All kinds of options. I mean, you name it, they have the options, and they refuse to quit. 
When you're tenacious, you're completely obsessed by it. I love history. love to study history. Got a history teacher right there pointing at me. But Churchill gave the famous speech, never, 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 never give up. And if I could encourage you guys today as I conclude, never give up. Never give up. Never stop. Don't back down. I understand that everybody needs a break, and I need breaks, and I'm fixing to take one. (laughs) We all need breaks, but let me tell you, the break is to refuel you to get back in the game. Okay, Take a break, but then get back in the game. If we back down every time there is sacrifice or it's hard or it's a grind, guys, we'll never accomplish anything for God. Because it's a grind. Ministry's hard. It's hard. It, it's hot. It's hard. Um, it, it messes with your psyche. It messes with your emotion. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done. Because why? People are involved. And there's an enemy that hates the souls of people. And you're fighting. This is warfare. And we're not fighting people. So what the Bible tells us. We're fighting principalities and rulers of darkness in high places. And I'm going to tell you what it feels like. Paul described it as pressing. He said, I press toward the mark of the high calling. It's like pressing on that block wall over there. I'm pushing against something. Well, if I'm pushing against something, that's a strain, right? So there's a strain to this, but we can't stop. Never, never, never quit. And there is so much that has to be done. There is so much that has to be done. Sin is everywhere. I I believe that our job security is even better than the funeral home. They got job security because you're going to die. I mean, that's just it. Other than going in the rapture, you're going to die. So to me, funeral home is one of the best business. Funeral guys are the best business to get into because it's job security. But I want to tell you guys today, what we do never runs out till Jesus comes back. There is, there, sin is limitless out there. Sin is rampant. And there's always work that has to be done but I love what the Bible says where sin abounds grace even more abounds Jesus said it like this he said he said um, the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few there's a plentiful harvest out there that God is calling us to reach and this week Lord willing our church is starting something that I believe is going to catapult us to another place in this community. It's part of why we're here. It's part of who we are. And um, this week they will come, and and after service, if you're interested in serving, and I hope you are because we we need everybody we can get. And here's, I'm going to just say this, not just one time. Okay, Anybody can come the first time when it's fun, it's exciting, it's new. But next year in August, are you still going to be here? What did I just say? Never, never, never stop. So if the new wears off, do you wear off? No, no. Never, never quit. We need you. We need all of you. We need everybody to participate to help us pull this off. We're going to feed, they're estimating that we will feed three to 500 families and the opportunity to reach even more is there. As this thing develops, they think that the possibility could even be in the thousands. What is happening in Union County, and I'm hearing this firsthand knowledge, the people that are hungry in this county will blow your mind. And yet we have an opportunity to help serve and to be the hands and feet of Jesus and to grab our serving towel and to serve. Will you serve with us this week? If you will, after the service is over, we're going to give you an opportunity to help And to go to a little brief meeting, it won't take long. We're going to prepare you for what will happen on Wednesday and Thursday. And uh, if you need to take a bathroom break, do that. But then come right back in here and we'll we'll knock this meeting out pretty quickly. But uh, I want to just invite you to get in the game of of serving. I have decided to follow Jesus. Come on, stand. 
I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Listen to this. No turning back. No turning back. It's an old song, but you remember it. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, Still I will follow, though none go with me, still I will follow, no turning back, no turning back, the world behind me. Come on, sing it. The cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me. What does it say? No turning back, no turning back. Can I invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads with us today? If you're here today, as Pastor D plays something that would be appropriate, if you're here today, I want to invite you to take the first step, the first hit, which is Jesus. It's inviting Jesus to be the Lord of your life. And once you taste of Him, as we said in the beginning of this service, Psalm 34, once you taste of Him, once you taste and see that God is good, there's not a drug, there's not a person out there that can emulate that feeling. When Jesus comes into your heart and He makes you a brand new person, the old is gone, the new has come. To live is Christ, to die is gain. I found somebody I found a hit that nothing compares to I found a high that nothing compares to and his name is Jesus and I want to invite you if you're in this room today and you don't know Jesus or if you're here today and maybe you're a prodigal who's walked away and you want to come back today to the father's arms and his love and you want to experience him putting his arms around you that you're loved by your heavenly Father. Today you can experience the love of your Father. His name is Jesus. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I don't want to close ever close a service really without just giving you some type of response. So today if you're here and you say, Pastor, I want to respond to this call, would you just slip up your hand and put it right back down? I just want Jesus. I just want Jesus. I want to invite him to be the Lord of my life. Would there be anybody? Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. God sees that hand. God sees that hand. Oh, thank you for the hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. About four folks raised their hand in here today and said, I just want Jesus. I want everybody to pray this prayer with those four that just made this decision to follow Christ. Come on, church. Would you come on, give the Lord a hand. Can we just thank them for being brave and bold? Hallelujah. That's why we do this. That's why we do this. So I want you, just like it was your first time, and somebody prayed with you, I want you to pray with them, and you're going to help lead them to the Lord or lead them back to the Lord. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me, wash me, cleanse me. You are my Lord. You are my Savior from this point on. And with that declaration, I am saved. In Jesus' name.